you know, we were under canvas in Southampton uh, preparing for a D-Day, which should have been on June the 5th, but the sea was so rough that it, it was put back for another 24 hours. And uh, uh, General Eisenhower decided that if we don't go now, it's, it'll be at least another month before we can go again, so let's go. And uh, when, we, when we got out to sea on the Princess Astrid, the, the seas uh, were about, the waves were about 20 foot high. It was terrible and of course a lot of the blokes were seasick. But uh, uh, one of the matlows on board said to me, if you, if you stand amidships, Tommy, you, you won't feel seasick. He said, it's those silly buggers up forward or astern and, and the boat is tipping like that in the heavy waves. They're the ones that are going to get seasick. So you'll be all right. And, and I was. And uh, you know, when, when we were loaded into the landing craft, they were hung from divots on either, uh, both the port and starboard side of the of Princess Astrid. And we got into those while they were hanging from the davits, un unlike all the other people for D-Day. And uh, what they did, as soon as the wave reached its highest, they lowered us quickly, <laughs> very quickly, so that we hit the wave at its highest. And, and then we went down, as the wave went down, and what I remember about it is seeing nothing but water all around me and then coming up to the crest of the wave again and seeing everything around me and I remember seeing the destroyer get hit and, and that blew up and, uh, and I thought to myself, here I am, a non-swimmer I've got an Alpine rucksack with about 90 to 100 pounds of gear in it to keep me going for at least 48 hours I've got a three inch mortar tucked into my webbing belt I've got two 36 grenades if, if I go down in the water there's no chance I'm going to see life again on the, on the way in when, when we, we were dropped into the sea not only were the seas very very rough but on all sides of us, on that side, behind us, to, to the other side of us, there were rocket firing naval ships and the noise was absolutely deafening. And obviously with such a bombardment like that, you, you, you couldn't talk and it was a job to, to convey a message even by shouting because the noise was so terrific and it was bad enough for us because they were our they were our guns doing it so God knows what it was like for the Germans not that it mattered mm. but it's the one thing I remember it was the noise the horrible noise at, at the time there was a well known song uh, someone to rock in my dream boat. Uh, someone to rock in my dream boat. Something about a beautiful dream, which was popular at the time. And on the way in, because the sea was so bloody rough, I started singing this Someone to rock in my dream boat. And Sergeant McVeigh said, Shut your fucking mouth, Palmer. You won't be singing in a minute. I stopped singing. He pointed his brand in automatic at the matlow driving us into the uh, into shore, and said, "If you value your life, mate, it uh, you it will be a dry landing." And sure enough, it was. <laughs> and. We, we were dropped off, I should think, it took us about three quarters of an hour from where we were dropped to get to the shore. 
And what had happened, the East Shorks were supposed to have landed before us, well, they did land before us, to clear the, all, the beach of all obstacles and, and any pillboxes and eliminate Germans there. But when we landed, they were digging in on the bloody beach. And uh, uh, I remember McVay went up to the nearest one and and told him in no uncertain terms to get the hell out of it. So we had to not only clear the beach, we had to clear the pill pillbox that was uh, we, we were facing. Get, getting out, out of the landing craft, my mate Bob Presho fell. As soon as he hit the beach, I, I, I laid down beside him and I thought, oh, remember my training, that then I realised he wasn't going to get up. So I got up, went off up to where this pillbox was. I got there and found I'd, I'd lost all my <coughs> Tommy Gun magazines. So I, like an any idiot, I went back down to where I saw, uh, I knew Bob was laying, picked my magazines up. They were, they were 30 rounds. I, I chose the 30 round magazines and slip them into my belt and not into the pouches and then went back up the beach so in actual fact I did the beach three times and it still survived it was Sword Beach and the, the other code name for it was Red Beach and there was plenty of red on, th on that beach and I think I became a man overnight and I remember one fair-haired chap in our troop he, he had sort of, sort of very, very fair wavy hair and two days later that hair was white that's how it affected him it affected me with a, a mouth like sandpaper uh, my throat I couldn't I could, there was no saliva I couldn't I couldn't swallow any. I, I wanted desperately to to be able to sort of rinse rinse my mouth. I didn't dare use my water bottle because I might need that within the next 48 hours to make a cup of tea. So I had to put up with it. But obviously, you know, looking back on it, that was fright. Uh, stepping into this bloody carnage that we stepped into. Uh, what I was afraid of doing was showing my mates I was scared to bloody death. But they were probably feeling the same. But me, I, I was really worried. I mustn't let them see I'm bloody scared. <laughs> because up, after my mate Bob Presho uh, fell and got wounded, I thought mm, that really brought it home to me that I was really in it up to my bloody neck now. And I remember at the, at this pillbox, the, one of the young officers grabbed my tummy gun because there was a jerry behind the pillbox lobbing grenades over, which, which wasn't very nice of him. So this, this officer grabbed my tummy gun, went, went round behind the, the, uh, this pillbox and there was a <laughs> one dead German. After we got off the beach, uh, there being a seaside, French seaside town, there were bungalows all, all along the front. And as soon as we got off the beach, <coughs> we, we we sat in the <coughs> in the in one of these the garden of one of these bungalows and lit up. Of course, if everybody lit up for a cigarette because. We were, it, we were all very high. It was uh, we were on drugs, but it, it was with the excitement, etc. And we sat there and enjoyed a cigarette. But after that, we got the order to move on. And then, as we were on the road down to the gun battery, I remember Joe Pasquale. He was on the left hand side. I was on the right hand side of the road. And as we, we got to the 
grounds of the chateau there, there was a big wall and unfortunately just as Joe Pasquale was going past this wall a mortar bomb fell right, right close to him and, and it took a slice of his, his head away um, so, but there was nothing we, we could do we, we had to go because if, if uh, a, a, a soldier was wounded if, even if it was your best mate that was wounded you didn't stop and do anything about it you just kept going that was the orders that the, medic, the medics coming up they, they would look after them and so that, that's what happened to poor Joe Pasquale we, we had French commandos with us and they spent some of their time rounding up French girls who had collaborated with the Germans and they later shaved their hair of them, which I didn't personally agree with. But that, that's what the French, the French commandos did. They, they, they were the best people to have alongside you in a fight, apart from the Scotch, who were equally as good. On, on the way down there to, to the gun battery, uh, we, we had a newsreel cameraman with us, but I never saw him again uh, after the gun battery, so uh, there, there was a big uh, t a tank di a tank ditch there to stop tanks getting in, but there was a big wooden plank being placed across it, and we, we were crossing, we had to walk across that, and that, that's when this cameraman uh, must must have copped it because I never saw him again. And uh, when we we got there, we did, we did, we came under very heavy fire from German guns that were up on the on the hilltop just inland, because what they'd done they'd removed the gun the actual guns from the gun battery, they'd put telegraph poles in, so that by, from aerial photographs it looked like. The, the weapons were still there yeah. and they, they'd moved the guns back up into this hill and then of course they knew that our objective would be the gun battery so as soon as we got to the, to the gun battery all hell broke loose, shells, mortars, the lot and we, we lost quite a, quite a few men there and uh, we, we did get some prisoners but the blockhouse was reinforced concrete and the the chap who had the flamethrower tried to uh, melt the iron door so that we could get into the gun battery because they, they were lobbing grenades over from the top and the only way we could get at them was by get, getting into this, this uh, clock, the block tower but even the flamethrowers didn't open the get get these iron doors open, so we we were ordered to retreat. Then, and as the the guns weren't there, we couldn't do anything about it. Our next job was to link up with the six airborne on Pegasus Bridge, and uh, I, I remember there was one German aircraft came and strafed us as we were leaving the gun battery to go inland and that, that's the only German aircraft I saw that day that the air was filled with spitfires and hurricanes there was absolutely complete air cover and on, on the way up there I remember at what, about halfway there was a ridge and there were German soldiers laying either side of the road all dead, where they'd been strafed by the spits and hurricanes. And then, as, as we got near to uh, ben Beneville, this, this is the village near Pegasus Bridge, I tell you the, what, the, the airborne, they were so pleased with us for, for what we'd done. They, 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 really, they really made a, f a fuss of us because we'd done such a good job. With their help, we'd, we'd stood it because if we hadn't have held that position, 
the German Panzers could have gone along that coast road and they would have been there for D-Day. Mm. D-Day would have lasted 24 hours. It was vital that we held out there mm. because, as I say, the German Panzers could have gone along the coast road. It, it, it was ideal for Panzers, that, mm. that road, and it ran right, right along, uh, up, right up, up until Cherbourg area. Uh, I remember one one of the six air, air, airborne who was dug in at the side of the road. God, thank Christ you're here, are we bloody glad to see you? He warned us about crossing the bridge because there was a German sniper picking people off. And there was, so, so we had to be careful crossing the bridge because this Jerry sniper was having a go at us and you could hear the ping as it hit the girders or, or a bang as the bullet went past your head and I thought, oh bloody hell, I'm in for it now. And so we got across the river but it wasn't only just crossing the river on, there was another river just further on which we, we hadn't realised that there was going to be two. And that's where one of our officers got killed because uh, one, of the, one of the squaddies jumped across this, uh, this, it was a stream really, a wide stream, and he hand, handed his rifle over to help the officer across. But what he'd done, the silly bugger, he'd left his hand on on the trigger and and as he went to, to pull the officer across he shot him and the, and the officer was killed there and then which was a pity he was he was a young and very good officer yeah. so we, we were obviously going to miss him but after that we, we then made our way um, with spasmodic opposition from German snipers and uh, machine gunners and we got to a little village called Holger which was was then we had to dig in there what we were meant to do was to go f further on and the, the name of the village across the Yorn escapes me for the moment but we, we'd lost quite a, a few men we weren't, a we weren't able to go any further, so we dug in like hell at Holga. And uh, it, it was in the, it was a large orchard, and there was a big chateau there, which became the uh, number four commander headquarters. And uh, uh, a, a sergeant, I, f I f can't remember his name at the moment, a sergeant and uh, another chap and I, we were sent forward to, to dig in just on the outskirts of the uh, of this orchard about 100 or so, 100, 120 yards in front of the positions where they were digging in at Horga as a listening post so that when, as, whenever the Germans came uh, th through the orchard we were then got to radio back uh, the, the approach of the Germans and then, if possible, make our way back to our own lines. Uh, then um, what happened? Um, there was an unfortunate password decided. I don't know who the idiot was that decided it. The, the, the request was handle and the answer was was to be with care but of course handle is the same as a German hender for hands up and the, the, during the night this chap uh, from our troop came down and this, this sergeant that was in the trench said or whispered loudly 
This chap obviously thought it was a bloody German saying, hands up. He, he turned around to, to go back to our lines and the, and the sergeant bloody shot him. He must have thought he was a bloody German. It was a complete mix-up. But the, the, the poor bloke was dead there and then. He, he was dead on, on the spot. And the, the outcome of that was eventually that, that sergeant went bomb crazy and he, he finished up in a mental institution. But that was later. Then we, we were then drawn back to our positions at Holger and we, we dug lovely tr trenches there with, with a separate spot for sleeping in and we, we used some of the French trees as, as timber over the sleeping compartment and this was on the Tuesday and from Tuesday to the Saturday it was patrols, fighting patrols, listening patrols, the fighting patrols were to try and capture a prisoner, listening patrols, you went out at dusk as near as you could to the German lines listening um, because you always had a German speaking officer or senior NCO with you so you were near enough to hear what the Germans were saying and uh, th this was how things were from the Tuesday until the, uh, the Saturday. On the Saturday morning uh, it started about 8 o'clock in the morning all hell broke loose and the, the German 88s came up. We, we could see him on the, on the clearing each side of the uh, orchard and the, the 88s were deadly. You didn't stand a chance against them because it was such rapid fire. There was a bang and the next thing it, it exploded. You, you didn't have a chance to, to shelter. So that that went on till I think four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, what was it? Yes, but four o'clock in the afternoon. I remember seeing this German officer come walking up the the pathway between the two orchards. He had he had a cigar, and I remember seeing him wave with his right hand like that and then his left hand to there and the, his Ger German soldiers came up and they went left and right of him obviously ready for the assault and, and McVeigh by this time he was in his element because he was going to kill some Germans and he gave the order, no firing until I give you the order. And that goes for you over there with the K gun. Don't waste ammunition until I give you the order. And then when these Germans come across, there was a, there was a cornfield between us and, and the orchards. And as the Germans got halfway towards us, left and right of us, McVay gave the order, fire! Everything went, went crazy then and in the meantime we'd got in touch with the airborne who were behind us. Their artillery opened up and our mortars, ev everything we, we could lay our hands on fired on the Germans and the outcome of it was the next morning after the Germans were obviously beaten back there was over 200 dead Germans were, were found right and left mm. uh, so for, for us it, it was a good outcome and they had taken such a hiding that apparently we found out after the, the Germans retreated that night but we hadn't got sufficient men to follow them 
so we had we just had to dig in and they they came they came back how do you feel now about the fact that you were involved in D-Day? I'm, I'm proud of the fact that, that, that I did it because of the carnage that was going on in in Germany that we we had been told about um, what, what an e evil person Adolf was yeah, I, I, I am proud I took part in it and if I had my time again I, I would do it again.